Well, it's now 1030 and time for Brainstorming the Human Connection, brought to you by the South Dakota Humanities Council. And my name is Lawrence Diggs. I will be your host. Lawrence Diggs. I think I said that too fast. At any rate, uh, I am going to be your host and uh, occasionally accused of being the inquisitor for asking questions and needling people. Uh, but this is an interactive program, so that's what we expect everybody to uh, to contribute something, because that's how we make the whole thing happen, is uh, your interaction. And uh, I think, Colby, did you put some uh, questions in the, in the chat, right? And if you look in the chat, you will see some questions that uh, Colby has uh, entertained or, or have put in the chat for you to be thinking about while we're having our conversation so that uh, you will have something to say. You can formulate your thoughts because we try to get a conversation going because we found that it it's more meaningful when you actually engage in a subject as opposed to just doing the talking head thing. And that's the whole point of this particular program is to encourage conversation between all the people who uh, join us. We have on this program talked about the importance of libraries on numerous occasions. Um, and partly because I feel it is so important and it's one of our really under utilize resources. And we've had people who have been uh, reference librarians. We have had uh, librarians from uh, from different libraries around the state uh, and the university libraries, et cetera. But today we're going all the way up to the top and we're gonna have, we're gonna have uh, the, the uh, state librarian. And we're gonna talk about what the state library does because they've actually, not in the last few, you know, a couple of years, but a few years back, the state library was something different. I, I can remember when uh, I used it so much that they, they stopped asking, when I call in for services, they stopped asking for my my uh, library card. And we went on just like we picked up last time. They just knew who I was because I was always I was always calling them. And, and if they didn't know me by voice, they knew me by question because they always said, oh, this guy, he has some of the more esoteric questions, you know. And uh, sometimes they have two librarians working on this on the same thing. But that said, um, the state library has gone through some changes. And what we need from libraries have and expect from libraries, that those things have also undergone changes. And so today we're going to have a conversation from the, the sort of like 50,000 foot view about uh, libraries and also uh, how libraries are changing and uh, accommodating this new digital age. What's their new role? So my guest today, our guest really, is uh, George Seaman, and he is the state librarian. And George, welcome to our program here. Well, thank you. Appreciate being here with you today. Uh, let's start by giving a sort of a 50,000 foot view of who George Seaman is. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so George Seaman grew up in uh, the great state of Ohio. Uh, I was raised there. Um, and when I was in middle school, I had a teacher tell me I was uh, not going to amount to much and I was worthless. <laughs> and that was quite interesting as, as, a, as a child in, in middle school getting that because you already feel that way anyway. Um, <laughs> went on to high school, graduated, and I carried that. And I actually turned it into motivation. And so now I sit here before you, a man that has a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, and I'm going to begin work on a, on a PhD here eventually. And I've proven that I'm not that. And I don't hold malice. Actually, I'm grateful for my teacher saying that to me because it gave me the motivation I needed to become something. Um, I'm uh, married. I have three kids. Um, we've moved around the country quite a bit. I've lived in Pennsylvania. Uh, I've also lived in Utah. And we came from Kansas uh, up to here, South Dakota. Um, I was in Kansas for about 14 years. Had some great experiences there and, and just love the Midwest. 
And so that's, that's, man, that is me in a nutshell right there. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a lot. And I'm glad you told a story about, you know, you know, being sort of, let's say, put down, it, to put it nicely, uh, as a kid. And that happens so many times. In fact, one of my favorite stories is, in my first, of encounters with the library is the first time I went into the library, the library, the first thing the librarian said to me was, what are you doing in here? You know, and I was like, <laughs> but I mean, I, it was back in the 60s. So they, they mm -hmm. people had a different way of thinking. Well, we hope yeah. they've changed some. Uh, but that kind of, you know, I, I was first completely just put off and I didn't go to libraries for years. But mm -hmm. then I started realizing that, well, there's too much stuff here and I can't get it on the outside. You know? uh, yeah. And so and that was a school library. So I actually went to the public library where it was a completely different thing. You know, it's yeah. like the, there, uh, the, the librarians after you're there for a while, they know you they knew me by my first name. And this was in San Francisco, which is and that was the main public library. So. Right. And interestingly enough, about, oh, five or 10 years ago, I went to the library and the librarian there still remembered me. That was like <laughs> 35 years before. Man, you know? that's awesome. <laughs> you know, I mean, I walked up to the desk and said, Diggs? And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> you know, who are you? <laughs> are you the FBI? Uh, right. you, know? <laughs> you got the phone tab? What's going yeah, on? Right. How did you know? How did you know who I was? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so anyway. Let's talk more about libraries now. Um, right. What is your role as a state librarian? What do you do? So as a state librarian, I, I basically administer all of the services um, of the state library. And, and there's lots of them. Can you um, tell us about can you tell us about what, what they're doing and, and yeah, more? Yeah, that? absolutely. I'd love to. Um, so I'd like to begin with accessible library services, which I think is is one of the great services we provide. Um, it is for folks that are blind and physically handicapped. Um, this allows them to get access to uh, talking books um, that have been recorded in DC or we can record locally as well. They also have access to news, to magazines, to basically anything. They can also access that information in Braille. And so we have a connection with the Utah State Library. And so we provide Braille as well. Uh, through that service, we also provide uh, learning, um, basically textbooks or any other uh, learning materials that students might need that have a visual impairment. Um, we do that through uh, APH, which is, the, which is the American Printing House for the Blind. Um, and it's also a great service. And you know, the best part of it is, is I've got folks over there that talk to um, patrons all the time. And sometimes it's just being a listening ear because they might not have somebody that's visiting with them very often. And so sometimes it's just, man, just talking to them and, and, and getting to know them a little bit better and letting them vent about something or, or share an experience that they had. You know, it's also that it's that, that human connection. And then we also have our access services. Um, that does the interlibrary loan uh, among the libraries in South Dakota. Um, we also uh, purchase books still for our collection here. Um, we do a lot of South Dakota history, a lot of nonfiction. And uh, then we also have our digitization, which they are changing the collection that we have that is the state collection. So it's all the state documents uh, throughout the history of the state of South Dakota. They're digitizing those and making them accessible online. And so we're working on that, making it through our collection there. And then there is the collection itself, state documents, we have federal documents. And then, like I said, we have nonfiction materials we collect for library science so that folks, librarians can uh, have access to any materials on library science that they might need. And also for the Department of Education, since we share a building with them and we're a part of them, um, we, we also purchase education materials. And then there's uh, the last, which is the Outreach and Development Group. Um, again, another great thing that we do for, for libraries in South Dakota here, and that's we, we're able to, to go out and visit, consult. We provide uh, learning opportunities 
for them. We have a public library institute for new librarians, directors, or anybody that they can come and learn how to be a library director. And we also have um, an Excite for uh, school librarians to teach them how to, how to be school librarians if they need it. And then we have all, all kinds of programs throughout the year um, teaching folks on, on, on libraries and what's new in libraries, um, the things that maybe we need to go back to that are foundational in libraries, things along that line. So it, it's great. It's, it's really awesome. Uh, I see Tara Engel is in here with us and man, Tara's great. Uh, she uh, is, it was an uh, institute, graduated. Um, and it's great when you get to make those relationships too and be able to go out and visit the libraries and help them. I mean, it, that is one of the most fulfilling things for me. And I know it is for uh, my folks in the outreach and development. So, and so then, is, yeah, is, that, go ahead. is that one of Tara's things that she goes out or? or... No, Tara's one of our librarians that we, uh, we nag okay. all the time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's oh, one yeah. of the ones we got to keep in line, you know, yeah. we got to. <laughs> yeah, you know, you can see that in her face, the mischief, that mischief, that mischief. Ab <laughs> Absolutely, you betcha. So, you, betcha. so, you know, you mentioned a lot of different things that people do, and one of the ones that, that uh, one of those that caught my ear was training librarians. Now, is that a credential thing, or or is it like, hey, you want to know how to do it? Come in, and you may not have a piece of paper, but you will know how to do it. Or, or how? Yeah, that no, that's exactly right. Yeah, we do have a certification that's completely voluntary um, that, that librarians can get, but it's basically just come on in. We're going to share with you what's going on. Um, if you don't have experience, we'll help you learn. Um, if you have experience, we'll take the information that you have and share it around too. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a great opportunity to, to share, listen, and interact kind of like this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Those, those interactions are so important. Let's talk, if we might, by about uh, the change in, in that's coming into li coming to libraries as a result of the digital era. You know, I'm I'm sure that that you know people used to have to go and get a physical book if they could find it, and uh, that wasn't even if you had a public library. I mean, there are millions and millions of books. So the chances of anyone having all the books is just not really a thing, you know, I mean. Right, right. Uh, but, but somewhere there's a book that may have the, the information you're looking for, even if, you're, if it's an esoteric subject. Um, mm -hmm. But now we've got the digital age and a lot of those books are being digitized and put online. Also, a lot of information that actually you can't find in a book, you know, either the, if there ever was a book that was published on that, it often is out of print and, and uh, you know, it's in somebody's uh, collection or in a box at their uh, garage sale, you know, right. or something like that. So tell us about how that, those kinds of things are impacting what a state library does. Sure, sure. So um, I kind of look at it from the perspective of a lot of the public libraries um, and even the state libraries, it's bringing us back to our roots in a sense. Um, when libraries were established um, in Africa, there were some great libraries. Uh, the, the manuscripts that they collected, um, you know, Timbuktu has a huge collection, neighboring towns around there. And those places were the cultural and educational centers of the world at one point. And what was the center of that? Libraries. Libraries were right and smack dab in the middle because you have the collected information and then you bring the people, the scholars, and those that want to learn and grow society coming together. And that happens at the library. And so we kind of got away from that for a while. But now we're coming back to that where the libraries are being recognized as centers of education, places where things are being developed, places where businesses are finding um, 
that they can succeed, you know, and, and, and entrepreneurs are connected with resources. And so we're just coming around to that. I was uh, recently visiting quite a few of our libraries just around peer here, not, not in peer, but in, in the counties around. And I'll tell you, it's amazing the amount of programming they do. They bring those kids in, they'll bring adults in. We're learning how to knit, we're learning how to crochet. We're also learning how to make videos, how to code. Um, people are creating um, and it's wonderful. And then when you get that creating and all that programming tied together with the books and then tied together with how to find information on the internet and, and make that a viable option for you, it, it's amazing seeing the growth that happens. And, and so I, I see us doing that, you know, coming right back around and I'm glad digital happened because that helped us do that. And I think that one of the amazing things about the digital age is accessibility, which is kind mm -hmm. of where you started off. And as much as people can say, oh, the internet, you know, this is not, you know, have some negative thing. What they don't talk about is all the things that we can do now that most people could not do and the yeah. access that most people did not have. I mean, even if you think about like the conversations that ha happen on social media, which are people like to beat up on, and they say, oh, you know, like people send, uh, text messages and the grammar is terrible and you know and the people what they don't say is that it was a time when people didn't talk to each other at all you mm -hmm. know they don't talk about how some people people they were just invisible but now they found an other invisible people and they're having conversations and you can say well the conversations are not about anything it's not important not to you it's yeah, not important. that's right but for somebody, it must be important because they're having it, you know. Yeah. Um, we're going to come back to that. But this is a period, and I, th I think it's a good place to open it up to the rest of our esteemed guest here. If you have one, it, I'll start off with, do you have any questions so far? We have lots of stuff to cover, but do you have any questions or direction, things that you would like to know about the state library or libraries in general? Where are they? I do. Go ahead, Vicki. Um, you, um, do you have uh, access for people that have lost part of their sight uh, to read current books like the ones that come up on uh, the Humanities Council? Um, and I was thinking not just to myself, and I, I think it might be temporary for the next couple months that I'm partially sighted. Uh, but I was thinking about other elderly people that would like to read, but they just find it difficult. Um, so do you have to prove what how much sight you have left? Or um, do you have to have a, are you a card carrying person? And what is free and what's available? Well, what's great is the uh, Talking Books program is free of charge. And actually, the materials come to you in the mail, and you send them back in the mail. You don't pay a dime. Um, and you can get them for uh, just a brief time when you're going through um, issues with vision. Um, I've known people that, uh, that had surgeries. And because of the surgeries, they had a period of a couple months where they had visual issues. And so they were on the service. Uh, they were able to get Talking Books or or large print books or things like that. And so, yeah, these are, these are available to you. And actually um, uh, anybody can, uh, can, once you fill out the application, they can certify that, that you have these issues and you're, and you're good, good to go and, and you're able to partake in the service. Do you have to have a doctor sign off on it? Not anymore. It used to be that way. Um, but now uh, you're able to just have a librarian certify you. Great. Yeah. So please uh, get in touch with uh, the, the Braille and Talking Books folks and, and they'll get you going. And, Could I and jump I... in on that too, George? Mm -hmm. So it, you talk mostly about the Braille and Talking Book and people think of, you know, visual impairments, but it's, it's accessibility 
um, for everyone. So if you have can't physically hold a book, if you have an issue with that, or you know, dyslexia might be an issue, or there's mm -hmm. some some physical reason, you know, that you cannot um, do that. And also, the talking books have volumes on them in different speeds. So if there's an input that you know really bothers you that there's all kinds of adaptability to those and so it's a really great program and i i'm so glad we have that in the state for everyone so see i told you she was a pistol lawrence yeah oh yeah yeah i've, <laughs> I've, come, I've come to understand that <laughs> i love tara she's great yeah oh, anybody else? It. all right <laughs> anybody else could I, could I just jump in on that as yeah, well? Sure. Uh, for the Braille and Talking Books, as a person who sustained a head injury, I am a librarian who's now no longer able to physically read. I can see just fine. However, the input on my brain just, it doesn't work. And the option of knowing that Braille and Talking Book, right now I just use Libby, which is great, fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but the Braille and Talking Book, knowing that that option is there is fantastic. Now, the one thing I'd like to say is if we could get that faster with the one book South Dakotas would be great because I'm holding the discuss discussion in a like eight, six weeks, no, four weeks. And I haven't read the book because I can't get it yet. Well, thank you for that feedback. And I will I will talk to our folks. Josh is on it. He's already they're, they're already working on it. Okay. It takes okay. them, you know, two months to get something quality going, which I understand it does. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it takes time. It's just we're we're one of the earlier libraries who jumps in on it right away. Okay. All right. Well, and we are adding studios, so there might be more uh, ability to have this studio read chapter one, two, three, and see if we can't get it done even quicker. I think one of the things to keep in mind whenever we're dealing with large institutions is they're kind of like dinosaurs that the rats eating their tail, but it takes a long time for the message to get to the brain and then to respond. So it's, it's not like it can't respond. It just, you know, physically it takes, there's a lot of stuff to work through and, and every system, even though you have a system, it may not work for that particular problem. If it fits perfectly for that particular problem, then you get a real quick feedback. Mm -hmm. But if it's something that, uh, you know, like, okay, this is a new problem, even though it may look simple and it may be simple, but the institution doesn't know that until it has experience and does something. So I think I usually cut large corporations a certain amount of slack because I know that, you know, look, it just takes time because, you know, it's the old dinosaur, uh, dinosaur mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have uh, questions, comments? Yes, I, I do, but I don't even, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, we can okay. Hear you. <laughs> okay. I'm clearly very new to the digital age. I'm uh, from Yankton. I'm on the board of trustees, and we are in the beginning stages, if I can change the subject just slightly, um, of uh, assessing, doing a community survey with USD's Government Research Bureau to determine how and what a new library should look like in our community. And I would like to ask you, George, if you could, if you could build a, a library from scratch for the 21st century, we have a 19th century and a 20th century <laughs> library in town, but to look forward, says someone who doesn't know how to use the mute button, um, please list the top three things that should be included in a 21st century library, whether it's space, resources, whatever. Wow, very, very good question there. Um, I, I definitely would say space. You wanna have some open space. Um, you're gonna have story times, you're gonna have programming, you're gonna need that space. One thing that's been really, really popular with the learning side of things has been maker spaces. Um, I know I going out to Rapid City, uh, they have a great one out there, 3D printers, all kinds of tools um, for kids, entrepreneurs, anybody to go in and, and, uh, and be a part of and use. Um, and so I, I think that's, that's valuable as well. But the other thing, too, is we got to keep in mind libraries are noisy places now. But we still have folks that need the quiet. 
And so I would say having some, some space where there's quiet meeting rooms, little ones for one or two people, or, um, or even just little nooks that people can go to and have some quiet uh, definitely is, is, is important as well. Those are my, my top three. You know, if I could jump in, uh, George, on the, on the uh, maker spaces, that kind of goes back to something you were saying earlier about how early libraries were a place where people got together and more or less, more or less just massaged ideas, challenged ideas of all kinds. And many times people think of maker spaces as places where there's equipment that's unavailable to people. It's that, but that's about 10% of it. That's the right. real thing is all of those people who are trying to learn how to do, how to use a laser or CNC, they all have different reasons, at least slightly, of why they need that. And the and it is the the interactivity between those people who are trying to do different things. Those machines just act as a magnet to draw those people together to give them an extra opportunity to come in contact with each other. They're contact providers. And yep. a lot of times the people who do maker space spaces, they get this template and this is a list of machines you need and you need a room this size. And they think, okay, let me check that box off. But the real value of, of maker spaces is that thing of like getting people from all these different, one person's trying to make airplanes, another person's trying to make a boat, another person just wants a, a, a something that will help them hold something, you know, in their hands when they can't do it otherwise. All kinds of reasons. But that interactivity between them uh, and that connection, that is that is invaluable. And the discussion of what could be, you know, getting those people who are willing to think about and then act on that thinking, that's what seems to be something is important to libraries. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, there was a library in Kansas and I loved this and and I wish I would see more libraries model this, but they developed an, um, a um, business incubator type of thing. And so people could come in, use the maker space, but there's also space for um, bringing in economic development folks so they can share how to start your business. And there was such a synergy there at that place because people would interact, they'd share what they wanna do with their business. And actually, um, at one point, there were a couple of guys that got together and they formed their own company and they worked together because they each had that same idea in mind and they each had the same values. They brought it together and the three of them now have their own company. And that happened because of the library. And mm -hmm. it can happen so much more if we are just open to these new ideas that the library is. Well, that's interesting because they used to have a makerspace in Brookings, and uh, now the library is the making sp maker space over there because the old maker space uh, they they shut down. Now I will say the 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 earlier one they had more, let's say things uh, they had a better facilities, but when they dropped out, the library picked up the ball. And uh, as far as I know, they're still, you know, they're still going with that. And I, I have high hopes for it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else? Ideas? Yes, one other, one other yeah. question, please. Yes. Um, is it possible on the books that you sponsor to have one that uh, each one uh, with the capabilities of a Zoom meeting in case you can't be there or you can't drive? Um, I know some of them are occasionally, and I would jump on them. My library doesn't always have the review or the critique. Is it possible for every single book to have one Zoom meeting in the area for book? Yeah, every single book of in the world, or, or no, no, what? no, of the um, sponsored books, the humanity you mean one sponsored. Book, you mean book, book? Yeah, book? That one, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, the one book. I, I think Jennifer is the one to answer that question. <laughs> Are you there, Jennifer? I oh. excuse oh, me, I is. am here. <laughs> yes. 
You know, I think that's a great idea. And um, we are sometimes hindered by whether the author will allow us to live stream um, their presentations, but that's pretty rare with the one book authors. Usually they're happy to, to share that. So I will um, definitely make that an ask of our current, you know, all the people who've applied to host the programs this year, because, you know, then you can join it from wherever. It doesn't matter where he actually stops. You can, you can pop in. So I think we can make that happen. Right. And, and, and the nice thing about this program or something like it, should we do that, is that we can uh, give it a long tail by putting it on YouTube. So even if you didn't, you know, you didn't get it, you weren't available that time, you could hear it later. But it's better if you're actually on that program, because now you actually get to interact, maybe even more, you know, over Zoom or something like that, because the little discuss a secret about Zoom is you actually get to see close up what people's faces are and they often their faces or their tail you know <laughs> you can actually whereas if you're far away you may not know what they really think but if you know <laughs> but, but if you see right up on their faces I, I love that when we do when we do those zoom things with the artists and residents with the, with the kids because you actually see exactly what that kid's thinking when you talk to them. <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes, this is Lori. And I just have, I, I went to a film at the State Theater here in Sioux Falls a couple of days ago about the Oscar shorts. And I was able to see the ABCs of Book Fanny. And I would highly recommend that. Um, I'm just wondering how the library State Library and the association feels that that issue has um, penetrated the state of South Dakota. Boy, Lori, you uh, you ask a tough one there. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, so I, I must admit that we haven't seen as much here as on the national level and in other states. Um, and so I, I'm not sure that it's as, as big an issue here. Um, I know in talking with folks, there are a lot of folks that prefer that parents have that ability to, um, decide for, uh, their children, what they're reading and to work with their children in determining that. Um, and honestly, that's, that's my stance. Um, as a parent, I want you know, I, I talk to my kids about what they're reading and I want to um, be there to guide them in their reading. Um, and so it, 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 it's a tough issue. It really is. Um, I'm not sure that I said much there, but, you know, that's that's my two cents. <laughs> yeah, it's a hot topic. I'm just excited about the conversation this morning because I think the more reasons that we have for people and parents in particular to bring their children to a library and they get that whole entire picture. Um, and the occlusivity that's modeled at a library, I think is important as well. Um, yes. But don't I, th I think we should have kind of eyes wide open. I'm glad to hear that it's not pervasive in the state. I know Rapid City went through some issues early on. Mm -hmm. But I just didn't know if public libraries, if they were being inundated with this, these kinds of requests or or because um, it was just such a non-issue for such a long time. And I hope we can return to that. Yeah. And, and really, the um, what we're seeing, the, the majority of it is at the school library um, mm -hmm. level. Um, public libraries haven't really been impacted by it as much. That's good news. Thank you. I I could add to that, Yankton actually did go through, the public library did go through last spring, uh, a rather contentious uh, two or three uh, meetings uh, regarding our LGBTQ mm. um, program and display in June, which we did not call LGBTQ. It was really a much broader um, offering of books of all ages. And, um, you know, we will have to rethink that again, but it it certainly made the local news and it drew people to the board meetings who don't generally come to board meetings. And so um, it, it's there and, and we have to wrestle with that here at the local level. 
Yeah, you know, it just we've we become such a um I don't know what I can't find the word for it now, but as the mother of a gay son who was very supportive of her son, I know that the library was an important resource for that child, right? And uh, and an important resource for a lot of lots of children. And um, it was like out of the mouths of babes. If you haven't seen this Oscar short, ABCs of book banning, it's not it's not everything that you've heard around the controversy. It's talking to kids about books that they've read. And they are wondering why in the world would someone keep this information from me? It's just absolutely worth seeing. I've taken enough time. Thank you so much. Well, well, before you go, can you give us, uh, you know, a, the name of someone who, you know, who is involved in that discussion? Because that sounds like a discussion we we would want to have right here on brainstorming. Yeah, I think it would be great. I mean, I think if you. You know, the shorts are like 15, 20 minutes, you yeah. know. But do you know and, who do you know who produced it? Because we'd like I'd like to have uh whoever is working on that to come on and talk about that. Or people who are in Yankton, uh Mary, if it there was somebody that we can have to come on the program and talk about, you know, that struggle, because I think that's very relevant. I will do something on that. I just saw the film, but I will check into that for you. Okay, and then maybe uh, you could contact Colby. Colby, do, could you put your contact information in the in the uh, chat, and then uh, Mary or Lori could, if they have any any uh, leads on who we could bring in to have that discussion, I I think that would be worthwhile. You know, as I would call, call use the word abhorrent, as that you know, let's say reaction is. It's necessary, I think, for us to bring stuff out in the open that we people are thinking, but nobody's talking about, yeah. and 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 to give people a chance to struggle with their inner conflicts, because for many people, change is not coming fast enough, but for others, it's coming way faster than they can cope with, and yeah. I think the discussions that open up and give people a chance to look at at least a chance to look at things differently that or see how other people are, are experiencing it for some people that's that's a first time you know you have i think there was a study not too long ago that showed that 75% of americans have no interaction with people who don't look like them yeah and when you think about all of the discussions that we have and arguments and fights and, you know, revolutions about something that people, they have no insight into it. Yeah. And so they're scared of something. It's like the boogeyman under the bed. You know, yeah. it's like they, it may or may not be there, but they don't know because they've never looked under the bed. They've never been under the bed. You know, they they don't know, but they they're, but they're afraid of it, you know, and in their head, they can hear it but and feel it, see it. And I worry too that this conversation gets couched just around LGBTQ and, and trans because it's so much more. It's James Baldwin, it's Toni Morrison, it's Anne Frank, it's, you know, yeah. it's, it's big. It's Mark Twain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Right. Um, I, I just want to make a that... comment about um, school libraries. Uh, we, we tend to look at the purpose of the school library and its constituency as much different from a public library. And that is something we in Yankton have emphasized that, that the, the um, users, the stakeholders are a much different, larger, more diverse uh, uh, man. And, and I should also say that the, the overwhelming support in Yankton was in favor of the choices that the library made. So that actually was very affirming, um, but it's not gonna go away. You're absolutely right. And, and it's, again, I would say it's useful to have the conversation to bring people into it so you can uh, have everybody, at least if they're not gonna row, at least they don't drop their oars and make the boat go off the rail. You know, it's like you just get, get as many people involved in that conversation and realize that, you know, actually when you ban a book, it brings it, <laughs> you know, it, they get more, more readers as soon as they yeah. ban a book, especially with kids. 
Yeah. What? I'm not supposed to read that? Well, let me put that on my book list. I didn't even have a book list before, but I have one now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Anyone else before we continue? I, I just looked it up on Google. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, shorts on it. And I think the woman that produced it was Sheila Nevin. But you can access it very easily on Google, the shorts. Okay. All right. Lawrence, All right. if I could jump in um, yeah, sure. and tie it back to our state librarian, George, here. So my first encounter with George was um, his support in coming out to my rural public library after having a book challenge in my library. So we have faced it here, Gregory, South Dakota. We're not, you know, Sioux Falls. We're not Yankton, we're not rapid, we're not, you know, we are tiny, we have 1200 people here and we had a challenge and I mean, it rocked up my world in this library. So it's here and it's scary. Mm -hmm. Yep, no, it, it is. Uh, sorry, Lawrence. Yeah, go ahead. Um, no, I, I just wanted to say it, it is here, but um, I have colleagues in a lot of other states and it's a lot worse in other places. Um, I remember... Um, watching, you know, the video of the gentleman who was running for governor in Missouri, and he's out there burning books, you know, and I don't think anybody is in favor of that. Um, and so, you know, it is here, but I don't think that we're dealing with it to the magnitude that other places are. Now, one other comment I'd, I'd like to make on this is that um, I, I remember one time, uh, our local library, public library, did a banned books display. And uh, they had like this fence and inside it were all these books. And they did it in a way where they were on a, a, a on black and there was red and, you know, so you felt like these books were sinister and evil. And my son saw it. And he came to me and he says, dad, I need to show you something. I said, okay. And he took me to this display and I might get emotional here. I'm sorry. Um, and Winnie the Pooh was on there because Winnie the Pooh has been challenged. And that was one of his favorite books at the time, anything written about Winnie the Pooh. And he looked at me and he said, dad, am I a bad person? You know, it's at that moment that I realized that um, this is bigger than just the display and just these conversations. Um, it, it was making my son feel guilty for being a bad person. The beauty of reading and books is that we find things that impact us emotionally. We find things that change our lives. We find things that are notable for us. And then to have that taken away or judged in a negative manner, it, it really gets to the core of you as a person. And, and, you know, like you said, I think we need to have conversations. I believe in it because I don't think the folks who are challenging these books necessarily are evil or anything like that. They have concerns. Um, they want their children to grow up believing with what they believe. And I think you're absolutely right, Lawrence. We just need to get folks together and have the conversations, allow them to see these books for what they are and not this great evil. Allow us to see them as parents that are trying to take care of their children and not some great evil. And just make that connection. I really do. Because I know people that if they knew my son felt that way would not want my son feeling that way. I know these moms wouldn't. Um, and so... I really think you're right. There needs to be a dialogue. That's right. And that's what this is all about. And that's, I'm glad we're having this dialogue. Uh, if the, the most important thing I think that can come out of this conversation is to recognize that the library has a place in bringing this together. And it has, as George stated before, it has been the seat of a lot of, let's say, uh, cross fertilization of ideas, which is, you know, like nothing beats hybrids, you know, uh, the hybrid vigor, uh, you know, beats all of that purebred stuff. 
because that your bridge is a weak, a weak bridge. You know, you got to have hybridization and ideas, hybridizations of ideas that can happen in a library. Um, and one of the interesting things you mentioned about uh, Tim, you know, Timbuktu and how far back they went. The other great early library was in uh, Egypt, both African countries. And what's really interesting is even in those countries, most people did not read. They couldn't read, but the people who could read recognized how powerful reading was, which is probably why it took us so long to get public schools because they didn't want everybody having power. But now we have, now that we have people, we have public libraries, uh, it's the democratization of information. And so that's that can be a, a very important, um, let's say, tool for the rest of us. Anyone else? Anyone else? Well, let's continue, uh, George, about mm -hmm. uh, the adaptations to the, the digital landscape. Uh, what kind of adaptations are are you 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 making? You mentioned some of the programs. Mm -hmm. Are there how is it morphing now that we have this digitalization? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, we have electronic resources because, like you said, these provide instant access and unparalleled access, um, like like never before. And so we have um, resources online that folks can access. Um, you can look up articles from newspapers, articles from magazines. Um, you can pretty much do anything and everything with these resources. We have one that's Learning Express. Um, you can prepare for the ACT. You can prepare for any of the uh, practices. You can develop your grammar skills. I mean, there's pretty much anything and everything you could do in there. Um, there are health resources that we provide. Um, really, anything a student would need, anything that somebody wants to continue learning would need to continue to grow. We also have um, eBooks and we also have digital audio books. So we are embracing the digital world. Um, the thing that I like to remind folks is, and is that not everything can be found on the internet. Um, there's, there's great information on the internet, but not everything is there. And authors, if you talk to them, if they do research, guess where they're still going? They're going to the library because that's where the resources are. Uh, they go to archives, which is part of the library, you know? Um, so it's still there. It's just that people think now, oh, it's, it's on the internet so I can look it up. I look at the internet as kind of being like the dictionary. When I was taught researching as a kid, you turn to the dictionary first, right? You find out who Napoleon is, you know, from that high level. And then you find out references to then get you to other sources about Napoleon. That's what the internet is. It's going to get you that information you need right now. And then it's going to lead you to paths that you need to go to to get deeper information on that subject. And usually that's going to lead you back to the library, a library database, or something of that nature. That, and so, a, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. Go ahead, Lawrence. I, I was just going to say that brings us back to interestingly the 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 internet, in the sense that librarians also use that, but they use it in a whole different way. Yes. And just because the information is out there doesn't mean that you can find it. And uh, it's your librarian who can help you to know how to use the internet. And I always found anyway that the most useful thing to me is the librarians help me to find the question, even if they, and they won't know the answer, but they know how to ask the question. And that's what most people who are using the internet, that's what they lack, is how do I ask the question and to whom do I ask the question? And I think librarians and libraries are invaluable for that. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I, it's funny, my wife, every time she goes to search something, she's like, I cannot find it. So you need to help me because I know you're going to find it. And, you know, I'll get on there, put in one query and there it is. And she's like, ah, you librarians. <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah. it, it's really funny. Yeah. And, and one other thing, you know, going along with that too is, um, is misinformation, disinformation. We hear that a lot, right? If you want to counter that, the best place to go is the library because we're going to help you find the resources that are vetted, the resources that are reliable, the resources that are going to give you the information you need and not throw you into this tailspin of conspiracy theory or this tailspin of something else. Um, you're going to get that reliable information that you need. And we, um, as librarians, are trained on how to vet information. We're trained on how you figure out whether it is reliable or not and appropriate information to use and to, to believe. And so, that, again, that's another reason libraries exist. Yes. Vetting sources is something that if you have a, another day job, it's pretty hard to do. You know, it's like you can't. And even ones that used to be, you know, you'll have a newspaper that used to be really reliable. They mm -hmm. get bought out by some conglomerate of people who like just pull pull all their money together, buy it out, change the editor. And suddenly they're just like a tabloid, you know, because but if you're not working with that all the time and, you know, or know to check, even if they're reliable, usually to be able to know to check their sources and see, mm -hmm. well, it, are, is this a credible messenger or not? You know, most of right. us don't are not even aware of the concept of the credible messenger. But then, you know, librarians have to know that, you know, at least we we hope that's what they're, they're yeah. there for. We expect yeah. that from them. Absolutely. You know, there's one subject that I think that uh, we haven't covered and often isn't covered about the digitalization of libraries is Always in the background, there is this thing called solar flares that we don't <laughs> talk about much and digital viruses, you know, so that we have a lot of people who think, oh, well, we don't have to have books anymore. We have we have the Internet. And you think, you know how fast that could disappear? You know how you had all your pictures and you bought that gold CD? to you know to to put all your grandkids pictures on and you still have the gold cd and it's in perfect pristine order but there's no machine to play it you know how what is the what are the backups you know what's the backup for all of this digitalization and we're going from you know the books being um um scanned and then we say okay well I don't need that anymore I can really search this and it's uh, more convenient yes it is but what happens if we suddenly don't have access to the internet? Yeah, yeah, no, hey, that's that's a great question, and and I'll tell you the backups. Whenever we digitize something, that that item is still on our shelf. We do not get rid of it, and so we've got that backup. <laughs> and I'll tell you, uh, going through graduate school. Um, still, the number one format for backing up information is, and this is going to shock everybody, microfilm and microfiche. Yep. Still the number one. Yeah. Because it takes 500 to 1,000 years to degradate. And so it is, it is the most reliable. Digital format, you, you have to make sure you keep up with what is the changes are. You know, if you have a PDF, you have to make sure that's still an updated version of that PDF so that you don't lose it or have it corrupted. And so it, they still say, you know, for access, digital is great, but for long-term preservation, keeping the item you have is the best thing. Yep. And that's, that is one of the things that often gets overlooked, even like on, in our personal data collection, you know, like having your grand, if you really love that grandkid, get a hard copy. You know, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that that uh, photocopy paper is going to likely last even more than the old digital stuff, which you may not have a player, even if you even if you have the physical player, you may not have an application that can open it. Yep. You know? So yep. uh, that's it's really important. And I think that when we're talking about gathering and and uh, storing 
information, that becomes a very critical, critical part. Yeah, it, it really is. You're absolutely right. I remember um, when I was going through graduate school, we talked about NASA and how their data from the moon landing, some of it is inaccessible now because there isn't a device that can play what it was recorded on. And so they have these, these whatever cartridges or whatever, there's no way to even access the information. And I mean, this is NASA. You think, man, greatest scientists, yeah. greatest minds, greatest everything. You think they would have had a way to, you know, back this stuff up so they'd still have access to it. Nope. And, uh, and they don't. They don't. They don't. And just like people now don't have any way to, to play those, um, those uh, recordings on the, on the rolls, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The record, you know, those early recordings that were that were done. Who has one of those Victrolas? You know, right? To, yeah, to mm -hmm. play, or even can play a seventy-eight record. You know, it's like you can if it's in you know uh, thirty-three and a third. Yeah, you know, maybe forty-five, but seventy-eight. You right, know, right. Not so much. Mm -hmm. Not so much. No. Nope. Well, we're getting we're we're coming into the home stretch now. So, are there are there any things now that that uh, and I have some other questions, but we're not going to get to them. But I want to give you the last the last opportunity to talk to people about how we should be interacting with the 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 state library and librarians in general. What's what's the way that's the most efficient for the most people to get the most use out of the libraries most often? Okay. Well, with the state library, um, we do help with uh, research. So if you ever need help researching something, please reach out to us. Just go to our website, get an email, and shoot out shoot us out an email. Somebody will get it, and somebody will get it where it needs to go to get the research going for you. Um, same with talking book services. I mean, it's as simple as picking up the phone or an email. Um, we are very responsive to it, and we do want to serve. And I can tell you, I've met a lot of librarians across the country. And that is, that is really what I think is at the heart of most librarians is they just want to serve. So if you can get to us, you know, whether it's at the library itself, whether it's through chat, through email, through phone calls, um, we're going to be there to help you get access to whatever it is that you need. Um, and, and the great librarians here in South Dakota are going to do the same. They're going to serve you and they're going to love you and they're going to appreciate you and you know, you're paying for it anyway. So you might as well take advantage of it. Right. We can yeah, save you some yeah. money in the end. So <laughs> that's, that's the thing that people don't realize too, how much of the pertinent things, you know, it doesn't have to be like, well, what was the great grandfather uh, name of uh, Robert E. Lee? What was his great grandfather? Right, it, right. it doesn't have to be something esoteric, like mm -hmm. kind of things I asked for. It could be, you know, things, that's like okay what's the best kind of of extract for this almond pie you know those mm -hmm. are the kind of the things you have questions about ask your librarian yep, you know absolutely and, and even if they they probably won't know but they know something more important how to find out you know and so yep. uh yeah that that's that's a, a missed opportunity even like the weather, you know, I mean, okay, just the weather forecast, that's one thing, but weather trends, you know, to be able to say, hey, look, you know, like the last, uh, today is is uh, February 29th. What's the weather been like on the last 50 years on the February 29th? You know, those kind of esoteric questions that most people, we wouldn't know like where to begin to find that out, your library. Yep, absolutely. And we love answering those questions. It's crazy. We love it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One of our favorite things to do. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And of course, the more people who ask, the better the librarians become because they mm -hmm. they get exercise and it pushes them to the limit. And unlike some people who just really get upset when you push them to their limit, I have not found that with librarians. <laughs> no. Yeah. We like the challenge. Yeah. 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 Well, we're coming up on our uh, uh, hour, and it's it's unfortunately we can't. You know, I don't know how if, how we can uh, entertain more questions at this point because we're within seconds of the thing being over. 
But I'd like to really uh, encourage everybody to go and use the libraries. Use the library, especially read the banned books, you know. <laughs> but uh, but use, use your library because they're probably your best bang for the buck thing that your government and your tax dollars do for you. They're just sitting there. And it's a resource that, you know, that's it's easy access and it's for you. Thanks so much, George. And you, you and I will have to get together and and try some kind of come up with some kind of conspiracy of some kind. Hey, I, it sounds good to me. <laughs> I love conspiracies. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time, next week, same time, same station. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you.